Meta Modern Era by Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi. Read by Sukhanil. Chapter 6 Religions. All the religions from ancient times have said that a man or a woman has to cleanse his or her mind through religious activity with a righteous life. The aim of every religion was to establish balance in every way to make way for the ascent of the seeker, the second birth, walihood, selfhood, Buddha state, Jaini state, Gnostic or Atmasakshatkar, are all names for self-realization. In the olden days, people always wanted to be honorable and good to ascend higher in their awareness. They obeyed and tried to do whatever was asked by the saints, prophets or incarnations. In India in the 16th century, we had many great saints who were poets. Even in the 12th century, we had some very great writers about spiritual life. The main theme of all these saints was that we must cleanse ourselves for our ascent. We must purify ourselves. So the greatest thing we have to achieve is our second birth, our self-realization, salvation. I've read a book about Jesus coming to Kashmir in India and meeting one of the kings called Shalivahana. The meeting is quoted from an ancient book of Puranas in Sanskrit, which perhaps the writer did not know. It is written that King Shalivahana asked Jesus his name, and he said his name was Isa Masi. And he asked him, Why are you here in this country? He said, I have come from a country where people are malicious. Mlechas are the people who have a desire to be filthy or vulgar and immoral. In those days, foreigners were all called mlechas in India because Indians believed that they had no idea of purification or transformation. Whatever may be the case, this was a conversation between Shalivahana and Lord Jesus Christ. So Shalivahana asked him, Why do you not go back and cleanse these people and teach them about Nirmal Tattva? the principle of cleansing. Thus Christ went back and was crucified within three and a half years by the Romans who were not keen about their salvation. Now the way the Church of England is trying to support immoral lives and illegal marriages and how the priests support the theory of genes shows that the Indians were right in calling the Westerners militias. I will deal with this theory of genes in chapter 10 on Metascience. The French were called Ferengis by the Indians, which means changing many colours, or of artificial behaviour for satisfactions of licentiousness. Later on, the British were called Saabs, meaning proud of their dress, or egoists without any spiritual sensitivity, but thinking they are God Almighty. According to the Bible, Shariat is written in the book of Jeremiah. These laws were given by Moses to the Jews, whom he found to be in a very decadent state when he returned from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. So he thought these people required a very strict kind of conduct by which they could reach a certain moral discipline and cleanliness, otherwise such immoral people could not attain spirituality. Shariat was not accepted by the Jews, but was taken up by Muslims later on, because they found the Jews were not able to accept it but they thought they would put it down for people who wanted to follow Islam, meaning surrender to the divine. I feel it is a misinterpretation to say that Hazrat Muhammad Sahib said it. He was himself preaching about Ramat, compassion, all his life. How could he talk about such strict rules for women? As it is, all these religions are very difficult to follow. Christ said that you have to cleanse yourself, you have to control your attention, and you have to see through your introspection what is wrong with you and try to cleanse yourself. Otherwise, he said, in the chapter of the Bible written by Matthew, that if your one eye commits the sin, even if you look at a woman twice, you would better take out your eye. If your hand does anything wrong, anything sinful, cut off your hand. He said if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek to that person. Imagine Christians tolerating even one slap on the face. When you see the way Christian people in the Christian nations killed people all over the world, one wonders by what yardstick they call themselves Christians. 
One can very well understand that these are absolutely impossible rules and regulations for advanced modern people to follow. These hard rules may not have been propagated by Christ, but may have been introduced by Paul, who was a squatter in the Bible and who edited it. He was an epileptic. According to the principles of Sahaja Yoga, he was possessed and wrote all kinds of lies through Peter, who was the weakest disciple of Christ. How could Christ give him the keys to build a church on seven hills? On the contrary, Christ said, The Satan will take over you. Who is the Satan? The Antichrist. It's not possible for an ordinary human being to be worthy of the Christian religion because they would have to be extremely sensitive to sinful actions, like saints or angels. I haven't seen anybody with a severed hand or with eyes missing in the whole of the Christian kingdom. This proves that their belief in Christ is followed only up to the point of going to church and listening to the sermons preached by a person who was not even a realized soul, who has not had his divine baptism. It is very surprising because our mayor in Italy asked me, how is it there are so many people attending your program for hours together? They never get bored. While when we are in the church, after 15 minutes we start looking at our watches, and after half an hour we just run out of the church. It is just a social event, but it is so very boring that after the lecture we feel like going to the pub, otherwise we start fighting with each other. After the blessing of the Trinity, why should they be so anxious to drink and get lost? Thus we find that in the Christian countries, people are behaving in an absolutely opposite manner to what Christ had asked them to do. He had gone into a very subtle side of purity when he said, Thou shalt not have adulterous eyes, while in the Ten Commandments it was only said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you are observant, you will be shocked to see that it is very hard to find any man or woman in the Western countries who does not have adulterous eyes. Of course, it is different if they are blind or too old to flirt with their eyes. They are always moving their eyes from one person to another person with lust or greed. It is impossible to understand how they can move their attention so fast from one person to another unless some screws are loose in their brains, like a doll which has screws controlling the eyeballs. The eyes start moving very fast when they flirt. They might become mad or get obsessed by one thing or another. In fruitless pursuit, how can the human attention be so mobile? After Christ came Muhammad Saab, who perhaps felt that all these rules and regulations were written down only for men, but what about the women? So he said something should be done about the women. Of course, it was not what Muslims believe, that women should be debased or tortured. He must have said that if the women follow an absolutely moral path, then men will also be automatically moral because the women create the men. He respected holy women. He had great respect for Christ's mother and also for women as a whole. In the Bible, Christ's mother is referred to as an ordinary woman. This may be attributed to Paul, who was a hater of women. The idea of the Madonna came from the pagan religions, which existed before Christ, and not from the Bible, which was edited by Paul. Muhammad Saab, who was the incarnation of the primordial master Datatreya, knew who the mother of Christ was. In Sahaja Yoga, she is worshipped as Mahalakshmi, he did not want women to be immoral and take to prostitution. In Islam, for a married woman, there are very strict punishments. It is said that in the Quran, Muhammad said, Any woman who is immoral must be buried in the sand halfway and should be stoned. Sometimes she could be killed. I wonder if he said such a thing, or if it was Muvaya who edited the Quran. But the way they follow it in the Islamic countries is really sinful. To give this kind of punishment to all those who are considered immoral women, whatever it is, it is very difficult in these modern times to find really moral people after the pattern that Muhammad Saab sought. Mostly, with fear, the Muslims appear to be moral. Muhammad Saab accepted polygamous marriages because he didn't want women to have relationships without marriage. 
In those days there were many women who survived after the death of their husbands in the wars they had among the tribes. There were many young girls who had no chance of marriage, as many young people were killed in the wars they had in the different tribes against Muhammad Saab. Whatever he did at that time, Samyachar, was very essential to create a new generation of very pure and compassionate people. Both Jesus Christ and Muhammad Saab were not only divine, but they were incarnations who had a special mission to come on this earth. These very great divine souls who came on this earth could not, perhaps, really understand the kind of people to whom they gave these precious warnings. Afterwards you see the reaction, in a very different way, of the people who said they followed Islam or Christianity. Actually, to a modern man, it is possible to say that he should keep control over his attention, or control over his mind, and also to find out through introspection, prayers or namaz, what is wrong with him. This becomes a mechanical process which has developed through the ages. They don't understand why it was said, and why it should be done, but one has to understand God Almighty, and to try to be good reflections of His kindness, His greatness, and His divinity. The prayer said without the connection, yoga, with God, is like a telephone without connection. Namaz is the way a realized soul can cleanse his chakras with kundalini awakening. Now we see a very different type of human being who has come on this earth in these modern times. Those who are blindly following the dictates of a religion are called fundamentalists, without knowing the fundamentals of the religion. They have to know themselves, what they are, and what they have to become through these religions. They have to see what sort of society they have achieved so far. If they try to follow anything so ardently blindfolded, then they become a problem for themselves, and a problem for the whole world. If you have to master your attention, if you have to understand your mind, and if you have to introspect, the vehicle that is to be used has to be an egoless personality, which can definitely give strength to a person, so that he can control himself and cleanse himself. But in these modern times, people are very busy with their ego ventures or conditioning. Their ego is very strong, and once they start controlling all their attention and their mind, and strictly follow the rituals which are supposed to be religious, they become more egoistical, because all these things are done by the ego or conditioning. That is why fundamentalists are self-centered and extremely aggressive. Mind, which is an illusion, creates the ego and conditioning, which try to control the mind in the reverse direction. Ego tries to control the attention. As a result, one develops a bigger and bigger ego. Now this very big ego makes one blind. Also, conditioning does the same. They don't see reality, as they get lost with their ego or conditioning and start thinking that they are the highest. They are the chosen ones, and that they have every right to bring everyone else to their own level of madness. This ego, created by a conditioned mind, cannot be seen. It only hurts others, but doesn't hurt the person who has the ego. The pampering of the ego starts when this ego becomes successful and later becomes a collective problem. Such a collective ego is very dangerous for the realization of divinity. Acts against divinity are committed in the name of religion or God. In Islamic fundamentalism, the main problem is that they say they are fighting the Western culture. Firstly, we must understand that Western culture today is nowhere near what Christ has talked about. Immorality has become the lifestyle of human beings in the West. But what about the immorality the Muslims are indulging in, secretly, whenever they get the chance? They can be worse than Christians. If you visit any of the Christian nations, you are shocked to see that although they call themselves nations of secularism, they all follow one particular type of Christianity. For example, in England, the Church of England is the only accepted religion. France is the eldest daughter of the Catholic Church. In Italy, one can understand, 
but even parts of Germany, Spain, Austria, Portugal, Belgium and Ireland are politically dominated by the Catholic Church, which has given no divinity to anyone whatsoever. In these nations, in private life or in society, can one find that the Christians try to imbibe the great qualities that our Lord Jesus Christ has taught? Only in name are they followers of Christ. They use religion for political control without imbibing the substance of these great religions. All of them are making money and are not willing to accept the universal, pure, innate religion which is the fountainhead of all these religions. Their own standard of understanding moral life through divinity is really very shocking. For example, they believe in heavy drinking because they say that in the Christian religion drinking is allowed, as Christ went to a wedding and there he made wine out of water. The word wine is used in the Hebrew language only for grape juice or for grape vines. How did they interpret that he made Benedictine, French wine or Scotch whiskey? It is very simple to understand the logic that you cannot create alcoholic wine in a short time spontaneously. It has to ferment, and then it becomes a very good expensive alcoholic wine that can cause intoxication. If it is very, very old, smelly and made rotten with age, one can sell it for a very high price. This is not the same wine that was created by Christ at all. He was constantly preaching the importance of a higher awareness, Therefore, why would he endorse something like alcoholic intoxicating wine, which is anti-spiritual in nature and which reduces awareness to nonsense? In Canada, I met a scholar who had a doctorate from some English university. To my surprise, he had written a thesis on how alcohol creates a greater awareness of divinity. Moreover, many people in Europe believe that by taking drugs they can reach a very high awareness to achieve their divine ascent. This is all absurdity to the ultimate extreme. But who can tell them? They can't talk to you after six o'clock anyway, especially in France, as they all start drinking quite early. It is impossible to understand why all these people have taken to drinking in the name of religion, and even when they give the communion of God, which they call Holy Communion, it is given with wine and some sort of rotten bread. How can anyone believe that this wine and alcohol which makes a person so sick and causes so many diseases and which is so dangerous for children has something to do with a divine ascent because it is the blood of Christ our Lord. What an insult to the great life of Jesus who was a pure incarnation for innocence, logos or om. Somehow my luck has been to have a residence very near pubs and churches when I was in London I saw people going to the pubs and coming out, absolutely falling down, and others making a queue to go inside to take the drinks and come back in the same manner as the previous persons who had emptied their purses. Moreover, in the backyard of the big Catholic church, lots of beer barrels come and go, and that is the only activity for the whole week except on Sunday. On Sundays, lots of drunkards, men and women, sit on the stairs of this particular church with bottles in their hands, begging from the generous Christians, who want to pay for the alcohol the drunkards consume. All this is in the name of God. Some of the drunkards said they are in communion with the certified saints and bishops who are buried in the church. This is why they stick to the church and also mug the passer-by, as these buried holy men come in their dreams and forgive them. With the permission of the bishops who also drank like us, we go to rob others to drink. Here one has to say with great regret that many great saints and such were never recognised by the church and were despised and tortured instead because their divine light exposed the churches and the bishops. The Islamic religion is against alcoholism, but if one Muslim gets a chance, he can drink much more than an Irishman, Scotsman, Australian or Russian, and when he departs from an official reception where free drinks are given, he squeezes the hostess with a handshake so strong that she has to intoxicate herself to completely numb the sensation. Thank heavens that some Muslims, though drunk, remember not to shake hands with a lady. In many of the parties my husband and I attended, 
All the Islamic people there were drinking alcohol, whereas we were the only ones who were observing the Islamic protocol of abstaining from alcohol. It is amazing how secretly all these people drink. Perhaps they believe if a man does not drink, or if he does not indulge in woman hunting, he will no longer be considered manly. But when the women drink, they end up by fainting, talking about the way they are tortured as Muslim women. I do not know if there is a fatwa sent for all such women. In India, a Muslim woman can be divorced after eight children without any proper provision. If some men do not drink and control themselves with all efforts, they become abnormal. They think they are the most religious Muslims and have a right to kill everyone. They talk of hatred and violence in the name of Islam and suppressed morality. This has not helped anyone because suppressed morality is a poison for those who think they are pure and moral. These people become very hot-tempered and cruel and jeopardize the lives of others who are saintly and divine. The Sufis were realized souls in the real sense. In Turkey I met many who were seeking the truth. The poetry of Yunus Emre is absolutely heavenly. How could he speak so eloquently about global religion and about divine love? He described man as the most elevated creature created by God in his image. In India, we had Nizamuddin Aulia, Amir Khusro, Moindin Kisti, Kabir Das, Sri Sai Nath of Shirdi, Kanif Nath, all saying the same truth about global unity. The other day, I was listening to a lecture of a Muslim Sudanese gentleman who was speaking from Mecca, where they had a very big conference of Islamic people who had gone for Hajj. I was really frightened that this orator who was showing his feats preached that the whole world should be forced to become Islamic. His face burned with rage, and such fury emitted from his bodily gestures. Luckily, I had a friend who was very good at Arabic next to me to translate. The Sudanese spoke as if he knew absolutely what was right, as if he knew he was the master of the ceremony of salvation, as if he were the saviour of the world, and knew that he had a right to dominate the whole world with his poisonous ideas. About two days later, we heard of the stampede, where thousands of people died in that holy place just after his lecture. I hope this self-styled saviour is safe again to pour a greater poison of hatred. I went to Turkey and then to Tunisia, and I found two types of people living there. In Turkey, Atatürk Kemal Pasha, who was another great soul, had brought freedom for women and a complete new vision of life. But as a result, the women who were educated or of rich families, and men of the same kind, were trying to change into the image of a German person in Turkey. They were so impressed by Germans. The reason they gave was that there are lots of Turkish people in Germany who praise the Germans for their skill in making good machines, and that is how they have imported this kind of new lifestyle. On the contrary, I feel the Turkish are very capable in every way. A long time ago, when invasion and occupation was considered a great achievement, the Turkish ruled half of Europe. In art, they are very deep, and they are masters of ancient Mughal art even today. They are excellent cooks and tailors. They have all the talent. So it is very surprising how German culture, which has no talent for art, not even an appreciation, has impressed them so much. They produce carpets called hereke, which are the last word in art as far as weaving is concerned. Their silverware, ornaments in gold and diamonds, are beautiful copies of those of the ancient kings and czars of Russia. The women whom I saw in the hotel had come for a wedding party. They were all dressed up just like very modern German elite ladies who were anxious to show their bodies as much as possible. It is the main principle of Western culture that the women should show their bodies as much as possible and attract more men. In simple words, it is a prostitute's profession to do such a thing to attract men and to get favours from them. What is the need to attract men and flirt with them? What is the need for men to flirt with women? There is no commandment in the Bible or the Quran or anywhere to that effect. Flirting is sinful and creates a confused personality, 
and a very disturbed attention. As a result, the fundamentalists are opposed to this kind of Western infiltration into the culture of their country. I talked to these ladies and I told them, why don't you dress up like your own people? There's no perda in Turkey, but fundamentalist women wear chada or burka like a shuttlecock. The westernized women are afraid of them. They think they carry a dagger or maybe a gun hidden inside their dress. The religious ladies look also quite bloodthirsty. There's no peace in their faces. Why don't you take to the culture of your own people? The fundamentalists will be finished the day you give up this Western culture. To my amazement, I discovered that not only do they get their clothes from Germany, but also their cakes and food. While Turkey is the place where they make the best food and the best clothes in the whole world, it is some sort of slavish mentality that these women and men feel inferior and try to make up for it by copying the Germans, the so-called superior race of Germans who have no EQ, no emotional intelligence. They can flare up any time. I don't think there is anything to copy in their culture. Once I went to Munich, and I saw a garden and told some people that I would like to visit that garden. They said, Mother, you can't go there. I was amazed. Why shouldn't I go to see that garden? They said, because it is an open bedroom for so many people in the daytime and also in the night. It's a collective operation going on there, and you won't be able to stand it. You will just vomit. Thanks to the warning, I didn't go inside that garden called the English Garden, because I would have been sick for days. The culture of the West is very sex-oriented. For example, I went to Switzerland, and we were going for a picnic on Lake Lausanne, when one of the boys came running to me, Mother, don't go there. I was surprised why he said so, and I wanted to see what was happening. They said, Mother, all the women are half naked. In Switzerland, imagine, it is so very cold and they were half naked. In Brighton, England, they started a nude club or something like that, and the women entered without any clothes into the water, which was very cold. A television man asked them, How do you feel? They said, we feel very warm, very nice, very good. I was surprised. How could these women who were new tell such lies by saying that it was very warm and beautiful? Maybe to spread their cult of nudity, which they believe is the only way to salvation. On the whole, if you see, Western culture denies Christ, who sacrificed his life for the sins of the people. Those who call themselves Christians indulge in all kinds of activities which are antichrist. When Christ came into this world in the realm of divinity, one had to go through penance, the Pasya. Buddha and Mahavira had to do the same at that time. Christians do not know what is penance, and they cannot sacrifice even a pin for others. Yet they are very good at lip service and grabbing. Big conferences are held in the developing nations for monetary help. The developed countries pass resolutions and pay for these conferences. The outcome is that nothing can be done for the poor countries, while Westerners spend their superfluous money on all kinds of waste. Only after realization does one feel the collectiveness of the world. Otherwise, money is the only religion that is worshipped. It is the money that matters for itself. The world is full of sensationalism and domination by entrepreneurs. It is also evident that people have no brains of their own. For example, 25 years ago, nobody used to go for a holiday. Now, during the year, they will earn all their salaries, slim down, make their bodies look very attractive and drive to the seashores. Northern people in England go to the south and southern people go to the north. It's the same with France. France is the worst. When it comes to shamelessness, no one can beat the French. The south of France is something special. People really go amok. They come with a hired lady friend from some school or college, and under the open sky they insult the ocean, which is unfortunately being polluted by oil spills. This is another story, where many ships carrying oil deliberately wreck to create an accident, to get a lot of money from insurance. It is a common practice that you cannot travel on Fridays and Sundays anywhere, 
because there is such a lot of traffic on the way of these mad people running away from home, going to the sea and sitting in the sun, and consequently developing skin cancers. Christians are supposed to attend church, or at least pray at home for the well-being of all human beings, or at least for the well-being of Christians, but they carry bottles of alcohol and sit in the sun the whole day. Nowadays, the Germans run after the sun and travel even to South Africa. I am sure that one day they will come to India to sunbathe, and then develop cancer of the skin, and give a good income from the tourists for Indian doctors who treat them. All this goes on very well in the West, and there is no limit to what extent the hankering for shamelessness, vulgarity and prostitution works. All people from the developing countries who go abroad first feel amused and then extremely interested by these lifestyle gimmicks of the Western people. Even in India, the curse of modern culture is evident in so many cities, with nudity and immorality which are against divine culture already well planted. The Indians are taking to the bathroom culture of the West, where people only bathe with perfumes. Indians have a great sense of personal cleanliness. If Western people cannot even keep their bodies clean, how can they even think of keeping their minds and their hearts clean? The whole trend is towards getting more dirty, more vulgar, more shameless, and behaving more absurdly towards the divine. As a result, they are suffering from mysterious and incurable diseases. Ego is against Christ. As the people in the West don't respect themselves, they also do not respect others. Thus, they are extremely egoistical and arrogant. They feel that if somebody is humble, he is a weak person, while Christ has said, the meek will inherit the earth. They advertise openly about their ego and what things can please their ego. I have seen advertisements about smoking, stating that it makes you look egoistical, handsome. The training of children in the West is to develop the ego. Also, very surprisingly, children are told to grab things from others rather than to share with others. I'm talking about democratic countries where there is no understanding of compassion and humility. Although they are Christians, they do not practice Christianity. So the fundamentalists of the Christian religion have now become a new type, those who believe in a new culture of people. They go to church with their skinheads, and on their return they kill Hindu ladies who wear kumkum, the mark of marriage. They worship Christ and call themselves dot-busters and look like vagabonds. They never wear suits anymore, neither do they have proper dresses. They wear the same clothes for the whole year and hold very high positions in the media or in other organisations. People laugh at a person who is not in this kind of lousy, shabby, repulsive attire. One has to appear rustic and innocent like a primitive villager, while the brain is ultra-modern. Islamic fundamentalists believe that they are fighting these Western modern fundamentalists who believe in all kinds of absurd modernism. Even in art, in writing, and also in the expressions of different types of literature, you find that books which are popular are usually very grotesque, extremely vulgar and full of filth. France is full of these ideas, and perhaps all these ideas really come from France, where the politicians at a very high position have mistresses who can become prime ministers. There is no ideal for the people to follow. Idealism ended with Marie Antoinette, who was killed by the public, who themselves had become bourgeois. All their lives have changed, and they have taken to all the mannerisms of the bourgeois, which they condemned, and therefore hanged their king and queen. Thus we have a society of very licentious and vulgar people. The qualities that were very important in the West were given by Christ, but nobody cared for them. It has become a very immoral society all over the democratic Christian community. The effect of this Christian culture is worse, I felt, in Tunisia, because I saw the ladies of Tunisia dressed up just like French women with very scanty and transparent clothes. And they told us that the Muslim fundamentalists are constantly threatening them. I said, Why do you follow these cursed French women? What is so great about French culture? 
It is said that in France, the housewife is allowed to have a profession of a part-time prostitute. If this is so, why should you take to a culture which is absolutely against your religion and against your country? The Tunisian ladies really understood this. I said, if you dress the way Tunisian ladies dress and behave with culture, then the fundamentalists will have no grounds to fight. The fundamentalist Muslims have certain grounds to say that they will kill anyone who takes to this culture, but they have also to understand that the position that they have taken of forced morality is absolutely absurd. With this kind of stand, they cannot change the onslaught of Western culture. They themselves are secretly leading a very licentious and perverted life. The yoke of morality is only on women and not on men. This lady, Taslima Nazarin, I was surprised to see wore jeans and smoked. Is this the idea of freedom she has about women? A superficial transformation cannot justify her stand against the atrocities on the Muslim women. Everyone knows very well that Muslim women are under great financial pressure. Once I was going to Aurangabad in India, and on the way my car failed near Daulatabad, meaning the city of wealth. Here there was a crowd of Muslim women. They were filling water from a tap which was broken, and I got down from the car and started talking to them. They were all Muslim women who were divorced, talak, by their husbands. Each one of them had seven to eight children, and very, very little mare, compensation, alimony, was given to them. They were just starving. They were taking the water from the tap, and they said that sometimes they got some work on the roads when they were being repaired, or some new roads had to be made. They lived in some sort of a shelter, made of broken pieces of tin or some dried leaves covered with tin and stones to hold them together. Some houses were made of ordinary mud, the worst living conditions. They said that in the rainy season they slept under railway bridges, absolutely the lowest and the poorest women trying to live with their children, half naked and starving. They told me that some of the children had died and they could not get any money from their husbands. The husbands say, talak, 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 three times, and they are left absolutely alone on the streets and they have to go on like this till they die. There were so many women there and tears started coming down my eyes. I just couldn't bear it. When I think about all of them, I wonder what this religion of compassion and love, of Rahim and Ramad, that Muhammad Saab had talked about, really is. It is a furnace of fear and constant torture leading to death. Who will save these women? So many of these Muslim children are dying because their parents are divorced and they don't know where to go. But there is no way of getting out of this miserable existence. There was one very important case in our country, the Shah Banu case, where a lady said that she should get some money from her husband for her maintenance. In our country, there has been a big problem because the people at the helm of affairs are constantly trying to appease the minorities. They call it secularism. The party in the majority is ruling in this balancing way by appeasing them all the time and agreeing to whatever atrocities they commit. We have Muslim law and Christian law, separate from the general law. The Christians cannot get divorced according to Catholic law. In the Shah Banu case, though, the Supreme Court had said that this lady should get money from her husband for her maintenance. The then Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, refused to accept the verdict of the Supreme Court, saying that Muslims had to agree. Unless at least one Muslim man supported this, he would not accept this verdict. No Muslim came up to support the verdict. Are they so frightened of fatwa from Iran or from the Indian Muslims? Why do they not think that this problem, which their mothers had faced, may have also to be faced by their own sisters and daughters? This is the limit of things that are happening in every country. We find the fundamentalists torturing their women and using the Quran in a very wrong way. They themselves are very licentious and aggressive and big drunkards. It is unbelievable that they do not know what they are doing and continue to degrade their womanhood. So women will, if there is no fair play of justice, 
take to Western lifestyles. They think that is the only escape. I met a Russian who asked me why the UN was helping the Muslims in Bosnia. He said that Russia had problems from Azerbaijanis, but had managed them and also controlled matters in Chechnya. The UN does not know about Muslims because they have many Muslim nations as members. Once they get hold of Serbia, they will convert the country into Islamic fundamentalists, as they believe it is a jihad time. They produce many children to increase the population in a democracy. Now Russia is a democracy, and how can we have a nation based on religions in a democracy? I was shocked at his perception of Muslims. I have such respect for so many Russians. I wish they could accept that this is not jihad time anymore, but Kiyama time, the resurrection time, the blossom time. Are they going to miss it? Both things are wrong. One has to understand that all these religions were born of the same tree of spirituality, and that people have plucked the flowers and are fighting with these dead flowers. Of course, there are some absurd things which grew with misinterpretation and interference from unholy people, which are common in these religions, which are like orphans in the hands of anti-God people. For example, Jews, Christians and Muslims believe that when they die their bodies will come out of their graves and they will all be resurrected at the time of resurrection, at the time of last judgment, at the time of Kiyama. It is so illogical to think of what will remain inside those graves after five hundred years. Nobody wants to think and understand that it is not the body, but the soul that will come out of these bodies, be born again as human beings, and be saved through Kiyama, that is, the resurrection. Who will tell them? No one can talk to them. As soon as one wants to talk, they react, and one can be killed. That is the only thing they know. How to kill to stop all the real knowledge. Mostly, they are uneducated. Those who are educated also try to influence them because they get the power over them. The greatest problem with the fundamentalists is that they have no compassion because they do not understand and love Muhammad Saab as to who he was and why he came on this earth. They do not know the reality. They just think that they are the right type of people and that they can kill as many human beings, kafirs, as they want and they can create as many problems as they like and they can destroy the rest of the people who do not follow their fundamentalism. We find that fundamentalists do not know the fundamentals of religion. On the other hand, the people who think they are very modern also don't know where this modern mind is going to take them. What a shock! is waiting for this modern man who has lost faith in God. Both ways they try to do things which are in no way helpful for global peace or for the ascent of human beings, by which they will have their own peace within their heart. Actually, Hazrat Muhammad never made Islam an exclusive religion in the Quran. He very respectfully talked about Moses, Abraham, Christ and his mother, one after another. Even so, Muslims believe they are exclusive. Jews and Christians also believe theirs are exclusive religions. There is another problem. They believe that Muhammad was the exclusive messenger of God, and Christians believe that Christ is the last word, while Jews believe that their Saviour has yet to come. If these incarnations were the last ones, why did Muhammad say, I will send you the twelfth Mahdi? Also, why did Christ say that he would send the Holy Ghost? We cannot say how long the Jews are going to wait for their Saviour to come. They are praying and crying before the wailing wall, wearing the Torah in small amulets. But actually the most important thing for them is to collect the money that they have lent and buy diamonds at any cost. Muslims who are not educated enough to understand the Quran in its original form believe that they are the soldiers of jihad, which is led by some very clever, ego-oriented, educated people. They have not even read the Quran, which was edited forty years after the death of Muhammad Saab. The editor himself was the most cruel man who killed Hazrat Ali, his two sons and two other caliphs. 
It is said that the mother of this fifth Khalifa ate the raw liver of the fourth Khalifa. In this jihad, how many Muslims are going to die? On one side they produce more children to create a Muslim majority, and on the other side they are getting killed in thousands. The jihad has become imminent, and the Muslims are a real threat to the peace and progress of every country in which they live. The only way to get over this brutal image is to become a wali, or a real Sufi. This is what Muslims need, the achievement of peaceful coexistence through self-realization. The same is the case with Jews and Christians. They believe in the same Bible, Muslims believe in the Old Testament as well as the Jews, but they nevertheless kill each other. It is painful and extremely heart-wrenching that when all over the world people have been able to enter into the kingdom of God as promised, all these fundamentalists of different religions are killing each other. May God bless them with sanity and wisdom. They should get their second birth. Know thyself is the beginning of the ascent. Muhammad Saab has said, if you do not know yourself, you cannot know God. One can understand why Judaism, Christianity and Islam, all these three religions, became extremely aggressive. In the beginning, when they started, there was a lot of turmoil, disturbances and aggression to the point of destruction. As a result, to preserve and to protect themselves, they started a religion based on war. They talked of love, but revenge became the hidden main theme of their religions. Moreover, they follow a book, each separately. They are lost in the web of words, Shabdajalam. There was a development in India also on the same lines. When the Hindus were oppressed by the invading Muslims, the need arose for a new force to fight this scourge. As a result, the Sikh religion emerged. Every Hindu family in the Punjab was asked for a son, perhaps its eldest son, to join the Sikh religion and to fight Muslim aggression. The rest of the Hindus remained passive and in their pursuit of their ascent. There are other religions like Buddhism and Jainism. These religions believed in suffering and tolerance. They also believed in compassion. Despite this, gradually some of their followers, who had become very mentally equipped by reading books or ritualism, went into many divisions. Some Hindus formed a new religion called Arya Samaj against the orthodox Hindu ritualistic religion, believing in the formless power. The people of this religion are extremely aggressive in their arguments. They are another type of people who believe that they know everything about spirituality. It is difficult to talk to any one of them or to convince them that they are still on a mental level. The Hindus believed in tolerance, but after some time they too became very oppressed by the Muslims and Christians and started to take to a very defensive attitude of fighting. Then there are the Chinese religions, which believe in non-violence more to animals than to human beings. So all these religions, so great and so sublime, were brought to some sort of a new form, which had aggression built inside it. These conditionings of religions have separated human beings. The only way to solve this problem is by understanding that all religions in their essence are the same, and all the religions must be respected. One person should not belong to one religion, but to all the religions, or to the religion which is within himself, innate and enlightened. And this religion is in everyone, so we can call it a universal, pure, innate religion. This will give the real meaning of Gandhian secularism, which is not for votes, as in India presently practiced, but for establishing inner unity. In the Hindu religion, it is believed that every human being has the reflection of God in his heart, which is the spirit, the Atma. If that is the case, how could we divide Hindu society into different castes? In the beginning of civilization in India, for thousands of years people followed caste according to the nature of the person. This is called jati, meaning the aptitude of a person. A person who has an aptitude to achieve the divine was called Brahman. 
These people had to be absolutely pure, totally away from power and money. The second group of people were called kshatriyas, who were power-oriented and were responsible for protecting the people who were innocent, religious and oppressed. The third caste was called vaishyas and had interest in business and in making money. The fourth were the people called shudras, meaning people of the lower awareness who just wanted to serve other people for money by very menial services. But this was according to the innate aptitude and liking of a person and never according to the birth. Later on, Sri Rama, who was one of the incarnations on this earth, showed in his own life that he respected people for their aptitude. For example, when Sri Rama was exiled and went to a forest, he met there a poor old woman called Shabari, who was of tribal caste. She offered some berries to Sri Rama with great affection and devotion. She said, Please eat them, because they are not at all sour. I have already tasted them. The food or fruits tasted by somebody else are not to be eaten. Uchishta. If someone has bitten off even a part of a fruit, that fruit is no longer pure and cannot be offered to another person, certainly not to an incarnation. But Sri Rama was greatly moved by the love of the old lady. He accepted the berries with much joy and ate them. He praised their taste and gave some to his wife, Sita. His brother, Lakshman, felt rather jealous and asked for some berries for himself. There are many incidents where Sri Rama gets very friendly with people who were not of very high castes. Also, his own Ramayana, his life story, was written by a fisherman who was a dacoit, robber. This fisherman was transformed into a saint by another heavenly minstrel called Narada. Of course, an ordinary fisherman who was also a dacoit had such respect for Sri Rama that he wrote his beautiful epic, the Ramayana. Then came Sri Krishna, who was also born in a family not of Brahmins and not of Kshatriyas, but of the milkmen who were not of high caste. Sri Krishna himself, from childhood, performed so many miracles. His life displayed that the birth of a child in a particular family was not the determining factor as far as his jati, or his caste, was concerned. He used to go to Hastinapur, and there, instead of eating food or residing with people of high caste, he would live with the son of a maidservant who was Vidura, a realized soul. Vidura was a low caste person, but Sri Krishna would always go and visit and stay with him and have food in his house and not with the kings of Hastinapur. Later on, the caste system became based on the birth of a person because selfish people wanted their children to have the privileges of a higher caste without any aptitude. So the caste of a person was determined by the caste of the family in which he was born. Identification of a lower caste or a higher caste by birth was never the initial idea. Also, the goddess Durga knew two classes, Asuras or Rakshasas, satanic, and Bhaktas, devotees. It is difficult to say when Hindu society accepted this destructive caste system by birth, Perhaps also some fanatical priests introduced this curse through religious books by their own alterations. This is a very common phenomenon in all the religious scriptures, where some fanatic or woman-hater has put his own ideas. How can we take these scriptures as pure or fundamental and follow them word for word? They were not written or edited by the creators of those religions. In India, we have had many great poets and saints who realized souls born in a very low caste. We also had great poets and saints among the higher castes. This establishes the fact that caste based on birth does not determine the spiritual quality of a person. All these poets and saints respected each other and cared for the uplifting of human beings. These saints never felt that they were of a much higher sophisticated class or that they belong to a lower caste. The Hindu religion is not exclusive, and that is a great blessing. It does not have one book to follow. There is no organization of the Hindu religion. There are Shankaracharyas, heads of monasteries, but they do not have powers like priests or mullahs. Moreover, it seems that Hindu people worship and accept all the saints, whether Hindus or Muslims. 
Today, the Brahmins have become power-oriented, and Kshatriyas are, of course, also power-oriented, so they are constantly fighting for power. All of them are definitely money-oriented, and they make money by hook or by crook, in whatever positions they have. This was not allowed even for Vaishyas. They had to have a proper demarcation of right and wrong, and they were not supposed to grab money from people and to make money out of poor people. The word Hindu was coined by Alexander the Great who came to India. He had to cross the great river Sindhu, meaning ocean, and he could not pronounce it properly, so he called it Hindu, and thus Hindu became the name of the religion that Indians followed. While the English ruled, they called it Hindustan, but after independence, it was called Bharat in Indian languages and India in English. The Portuguese and many African countries like Eritrea call it Hindu. Despite all the regulations of dharma, religion, society became very caste conscious and it lost the basic principles of caste. Thus, in India, elections are now held according to caste and this caste system is very powerful everywhere. Even the people who made the constitution at first tried to exclude the minorities from the majority laws and gave them a special concession for forty years. But still, this concession persists, and as more people become conscious of these concessions, they try to dominate the higher classes, and thus a funny type of society has come up which acts the other way around. Short-sighted politicians are taking full advantage of the caste system to keep the people fighting for power. It is difficult to see how these people will get back to normalcy, and understand that they have their own aptitudes, which have nothing to do with the caste of their births. In Sarge Yoga, we have solved this problem. In Sarge Yoga, one loses the sense of caste into which one is born. Sarge Yogis become realized souls, transcending all these like saints. The false categories of caste and religion disappear, like darkness after the sun shines. They marry amongst themselves without any conditionings of caste, race, nationality or religion. It happens automatically, spontaneously, and these marriages are 95% successful. They are models of very good, happy family relations. Now, a few words about Buddhism. Lord Buddha talked about compassion, compassion and compassion. He bore all the troubles of those days, and at the end of his life, he was in a very bad financial condition, and ultimately he died in a very remote corner of India. Lord Buddha's life had been really ideal, but people believe that you cannot attain spiritual ascent unless and until you suffer like him and give up everything the way he had given it up. The ascetic concept is that one has to give up the family, one has to give up money, property, all possessions, one has to give up the normal life that one leads and has to be an absolute celibate in order to move on the spiritual path. But there are Buddhists and Buddhists. Most of their different forms are lost in ritualism or mental meditation. The Japanese follow the Zen system without understanding anything about it. They have built a beautiful temple of Buddha in Bodhigaya, where Buddha got his nirvana. When Genghis Khan invaded Bihar, the Buddhist monks did not resort to violence and died. Another style of Buddhism is that of the Japanese, who had to learn a lesson through the extreme suffering of Hiroshima. The Dalai Lamas preach non-violence, but they have been very money or gold-oriented people. In Beijing, one can see thousands of gold plates and gold beer mugs with Pali inscriptions in the secret vaults. It is said they were rescued from a river by the Chinese soldiers who went after Mr. Lama and his followers, who were running away to India and who dumped part of the gold they were carrying in the river. This was rescued and put in the museum. They wear saffron clothes to show that they are sannyasis, those who renounce worldly life, but live like lords in Dharamshala. I met such a Canadian sannyasi in Canada, and he told me that he had no other clothes but the ones he was wearing. He said he lost all his property to the Dalai Lama, who begs all over the world. In Dharamshala, there was a great protest against these very aggressive Dalai Lama people, 
but many governments have sympathy for this money-oriented, gold-oriented spiritual head, so to pacify these ignorant governments who do not discriminate between truth and hypocrisy, the protesters had to ask for forgiveness. As it is, India has a large load of refugees, and they cannot afford to have these gold-oriented sannyasis who have created a diplomatic rift between China and India. There are Buddhists in Nepal who believe in black magic. Many seekers go to Nepal and get lost. Buddhist lamas are of many kinds. Some of them have monasteries where, to raise the kundalini, the seekers are beaten on the spinal cord until their backs are broken. In China, they also worship Mother Mercy, Guan Yin, who was a Chinese incarnation. Lord Buddha has given three mantras to chant. These are the mantras used by sage yogis to surrender to Lord Buddha, or a realized soul, surrender to Dharma, and surrender to collectivity. The Buddhists use a noisy wail to chant mantras. Like all other religious incarnations, he has talked of Maitreya, a future Buddha, who will give liberation. Maitreya means the three mothers together will incarnate to give nirvana. This kind of ideology is also prevalent among Christians, especially Catholics, where young women become nuns and where young men become priests. These methods are extremely unnatural, because human beings are human beings, and if they are forced into this kind of absurd system, they somehow try to escape it and secretly live another life. That is how one can explain why some priests and nuns become so enchanted by sexuality. So many of them have somehow managed to live a very celibate life, but were so suppressed that many among them became extremely hot-tempered and had no love and affection for anyone. They were just like machines. They are the ones who helped the war criminals to escape to Argentina from Germany. It is amazing how the Vatican printed nine million dollars of counterfeited money to be distributed through their Banca di Ambrosia. Their connections with the Mafia and the Christian Democratic Party are challenged every day in Italy by a very good magistrate. In Canada, many children were abused by the church authority. In Austria, many priests kept married women as their mistresses. Some of them secretly live with wives and have children from them. They are fathers in the real sense of the word. The argument is that the church does not want to pay for the widow's pension, so they cannot say they have wives. If you see them and know the kind of persons they really are, you will be amazed at how they are also given peace awards. I know a lady who has been given peace awards and is one of the most hot-tempered persons I have ever met in my life. Once we were travelling to Calcutta, and this lady walked into the airplane with an odd-looking thing in her hand. She wanted to sit in the front seat, but the purser told her that the first seats were reserved for some infirm people, and they could not be transferred to any other seat. They had to sit in the front seat reserved for them. The lady then declared arrogantly that she was a very important person, and that she must be given the front seat. She literally started fighting with the staff of the airplane. In the small little space in front of the door, she danced from this spot to that, and this dance continued for about half an hour. Eventually, this lady was asked to get out of the plane. Actually, I could not bear it any more, and I went to sleep. Of course, all this happened before she was given this award. But if she had already received the award, then I cannot guess how many people from the airplane would have been sent to jail. Unfortunately, such arrogance is common in all such people who think that they are performing a great sacrifice for God, or for national work, or for any other global ideas. They become so hot-tempered that to approach them you have to use a barge pole. They are nowhere near God, and nowhere near any religion of compassion. The Christians are converted in India. They usually come from very poor backgrounds. Perhaps many Indian Christians believe that Christ was an Englishman born in Buckingham Palace. There is a joke about a villager near Allahabad. He was converted and given the name Sikanda, Alexander, so he became Alexander Bura. Bura was his own name meaning Blondie. Every time he came to Allahabad, he would go for a dip in the holy river, the Ganges. 
the missionaries who converted him said that now that he had become a Christian, he could not worship the river Ganges. He was amazed at this absurd proposal and said in his village language, I have become Saab, an Englishman, but how can I leave my religion, Dharma? It is the curse of democracy that to have a majority vote is important, so both Muslims and Christians are working hard to increase their votes by converting people or by producing many, many children. It is said that Muslim women are like factories producing children. The Pope is also very deft in political business and is not in favour of abortions, but he did not mind sending weapons secretly to Poland to fight communism, thereby killing thousands of innocent Polish people. So now we come to Jainism, which has very amusing practices. First of all, they want to save the lives, in any case, of all the worms, all the mosquitoes and all the bugs. It was said that they would take a hut and put a Brahmin inside that hut, and they would then gather all the bugs of that village and put them also inside the same hut, so that they might feed on the poor Brahmin, who would suffer bug bites for quite a while. When the bugs had completed sucking the blood of the poor Brahmin, they would get full with the blood and fall on their sides on the ground. Then only could the poor Brahmin come out of that hut. And he was given a lot of money for performing this sacrifice. I used to wonder why they used a Brahmin. Do they want Brahmin's pure blood to give spiritual life to the bugs as well? One notices so many things which are ridiculously absurd. How could they show Lord Mahavira the way they show him, nude all over? Actually, the story was like this. Sri Mahavira was in meditation, and when he came out of that meditation, half of his cloth was wrapped in a thorny bush, kunj, but he still had half his cloth upon his body. Then Sri Krishna wanted to test him. He came as an ordinary beggar and asked him, Why should you carry this piece of cloth on your body? You are a prince, while I am a poor man. Why don't you give it to me? Sri Mahavira, in his generosity, gave him the remaining cloth, and walked into his palace, which was very close by, covering himself with leaves. It was hardly for a few seconds when he had no clothes on his body, but he covered his private parts with leaves and walked inside his own palace. Now we find statues of nude Mahavira everywhere, with his private parts shown meticulously, as if Mahavira was nothing but his private parts. This really irritates any sensitive person. Why should they insult Lord Mahavira like this? If you notice the work of Michelangelo, who has painted the Sistine Chapel so well, he did not show Christ or Mother Mary or God the Father without clothes. He showed other people, but never them. So it is very insulting to see a great incarnation like Lord Mahavira exhibited in the nude all over India. Two years ago in India, the mayor of Bombay sent somebody to consult with me about a very serious problem. The problem was that the Jains did not want to destroy even the worms in feces, so they used to collect in a pitcher all the worms from their feces and put them on a particular hillock, which therefore became very dirty and filthy after the rains, and the mayor did not know how to solve this problem. Actually, I was quite lost as to why these Jains wanted to save bugs and worms, can we give realisation to mosquitoes, or to chickens, or goats? Who are they trying to save with their ideology of non-violence, the animals? First of all, you have to be non-violent to human beings, which they are not. Most Jains are very rich people in India, and they are also very immoral. I met a very rich Jain lady who had brought another rich and sick man who was her lover for treatment. Her husband, who was a media tycoon, had a love affair with the wife of the sick man, absolutely mutual understanding of Jainism. Some Jain doctors are very money-oriented and have no ethics. Some of these doctors are, despite the religion they follow, extremely crafty and cruel. Jains all over are very money-oriented. They always try to show Lord Mahavira as a naked person without any clothes. It is beyond any reasoning that nudity will lead you to God. All over India you find the nude saints of Jainism going about naked on the roads, shocking the modest Indian women. 
Once I found myself in a very awkward situation when I went to Hastinapur with my husband, who was a collector of the Meerut district. There was some sort of a dispute between the two wings of the Jain religion. One is called Digamba, where they need not wear any clothes nor believe in saints who wear any clothes because they are clothed by the directions like north, south, east and west. The second one, Shwetamba, believe in wearing white clothes but cover their faces with a piece of cloth to prevent any germs from entering their mouth and then into the body so that the germs may not be killed. Unfortunately, we first went to the Digamba temple and sat in the front row with all the paraphernalia of the collectorate when about forty absolutely nude saints came and sat on the platform. It was a rude shock to me. I just put my head down, and my husband went into a rage. These men were plucking their hair from their head and everywhere that was possible. For this, the great poet Kabir has said, By plucking your hair if you think you can go to heaven, or by shaving your head if you feel you are going to heaven, then the sheep which is shaved twice a year will arrive in heaven much before you. So what is the use of trying these tricks? It is very interesting that they believe that if you go on plucking your hair, then you attain the complete form of Jainism. All this drama really made my husband so furious that he got up from his seat and holding my hand walked out of that hall with all the paraphernalia of the collectorate behind us. My husband pushed me into the car and then got into the car. One man came running and asked him, What's the matter? Why are you angry, sir? My husband said, I cannot stand this lack of manners, this vulgarity, this insult. The driver had already started the car when he looked down and asked me, Why did they do this to us? I was already speechless with shame. I just said, I did not know that the followers of the great Lord Mahavira do this. I must therefore leave immediately. He said, you know about religions, and how do you not know about this kind of horrendous shock they give to others? I confessed, I know about religions, but I do not know about their followers, who were just the opposite of their masters who started those religions. Jains also have a system of nuns, sadhus, perhaps not only for women, as they also have celibate fathers, sadhus. They praise nudity and usually have shops of clothes, especially Western clothing. They have cotton cloth mills and all kinds of industries which are creating ecological problems. They are good at feeding Jain sadhus, but nobody else. There is an auction of a ticket for a person who is allowed to move a fan called Chavar, made of yak's tail, in front of the photo of Mahavira in the procession of millions. One has to buy this privilege by paying thousands or millions. There are ten essences of religion as valences for the human personality, which are like ten commandments. When they deteriorate, the human being becomes confused or aggressive. Many incarnations of primordial masters came to this earth to correct the balance of human beings by preaching love and moral discipline. The followers have made a mess of their teachings. With Sahaja Yoga, the innate universal religion of divine love is enlightened within, and the seeker spontaneously becomes truly religious, righteous, moral, peaceful, compassionate, a powerful, enlightened personality.